Well, welcome everybody to day two of the Women of the World Summit. This bit was unchoreographed. <laughs> We had an incredible night last night with Meryl Streep and Angelina Jolie and Dr. Ram Faley and those amazing women from Pakistan. And today we're going to bring you some really extraordinary women telling extraordinary stories. And of course, the most extraordinary of all is standing right next to me. And <laughs> And before she's gonna, before she just lets you hear her amazing words today, I want you to conjure up an image. Now this image is of a solitary woman in a leafy house in Rangoon. Throughout her long years under house arrest in Burma, separated from her husband, separated from her two young boys, the heroic dissident, Aung San Suu Kyi, was sustained by a poster she put up on her wall. It was a poster from the 1995 United Nations First World Conference on Women in Beijing. And it was signed by the woman whose words at that conference served to motivate and millions of others. You know those words, first uttered by Hillary Clinton wearing that pink first lady suit at the podium in Beijing, <laughs> very much paler than the one she has on today. And she said, if there is one message that echoes forth from the conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. <laughs> when Hillary Clinton spoke those 30 words, few in the patriarchal power structure were ready to hear them, Fewer still were prepared for those words to reverberate through two succeeding decades. We hear their echo in the voice of one of our co-hosts, Dr. Hawa Abdi, the fearless Somali doctor who has made history by creating a safe and peaceful civil society on her family's lands for tens of thousands of internally displaced people. We hear their echo in the testimony of Divya, you're going to hear from her later today, who survived rape and now testifies to the evil of sexual violence in India. We hear their echo in the voice of the young girl who spoke to you from the screen last night, the heartbreakingly vulnerable yet steely Malala, who had not even been born when Hillary spoke in Beijing. But somehow that message got all the way to the darkest corners of Pakistan's Swat Valley, where Malala asked, how dare the Taliban take away my basic right to education? Hillary Rodham Clinton spoke truth to power but she didn't leave it at that. She has worked to recast the conversation itself in both word and deed. In those tumultuous years in the White House, so often she was working unseen in private influential groups of women from the world's most challenging places. Then she strode into the Senate, the ultimate old boys club with a power and a grace that won praise even from Jesse Helms. <laughs> One of the finest minds of the 12th century. As America's Secretary of State, she made women's rights and therefore human rights a central focus. Not an afterthought, not a sidebar, central. Hillary issued a directive to all embassies and posts of the strategic imperative of advancing women's equality. She said it so well at the 2011 Women in Economy Summit, when we liberate the economic potential of women, we elevate the economic performance of communities, nations and the world. Her shrewd, pragmatic politics definitively, definitively reframed the whole conversation about the advancement of women. First establish that women's rights are human rights, then explain that unshackling women is just good business. And of course, the big question now about Hillary is, what's next? <laughs> I mean that in the way that every political handicapper means it, of course. What I mean is, will Hillary's worldwide agenda for women maintain its momentum now that she and her team have moved on from the State Department? What is next, not merely for this one woman, but for all of us here today and the millions that she has inspired? Hillary's words at Beijing jolted us 17 years ago. 
They seem obvious now, but aren't all eternal truths self-evident once someone has the courage to speak them? And so it is with great pride that I welcome to this podium the woman who spoke the self-evident truth that all men and women are created equal, the Honourable Hilary Robin. Oh, so much. Oh, what a wonderful occasion for me to be back here, the fourth Women in the World Conference that I've been privileged to attend, introduced by the founder, creator, and my friend, Tina Brown. Uh, when one thinks about this annual conference, uh, it really is intended to, and I believe has, focused attention on the global challenges facing women, from equal rights and education to human slavery, literacy, the power of the media and technology to affect change in women's futures, and so much else. And for that, I thank Tina and the great team that she has worked uh, with in order to produce this conference and the effects that it has created. It's been such an honor to work with all of you over the years, although it's hard to see from up here out into the audience. I did see some faces, and I know that uh, this is a, an occasion as well for so many friends and colleagues to come together and take stock of where we stand and what more needs to be done in advancing the great unfinished business of the 21st century, the rights and opportunities for women and girls. Now, this is unfinished around the world. Too many women are still treated, at best, as second-class citizens, at worst, as some kind of subhuman species. Those of you who were there last night saw that remarkable film that interviewed men, primarily in Pakistan, talking very honestly about their intention to continue to control the women in their lives and their reach. But the business is also unfinished here at home in the United States. We've come so far together, but there is still work to be done. Now, I have always believed that women are not victims. We are agents of change. We are drivers of progress. We are makers of peace. All we need is a fighting chance. And that firm faith in the untapped potential of women at home and around the world has been at the heart of my work my entire life. Uh, from college and law school, from Arkansas to the White House to the Senate. And when I became Secretary of State, I was determined to weave this perspective even deeper into the fabric of American foreign policy. But I knew to do that, I couldn't just preach to the usual choir, that we had to reach out, not only to men, in solidarity and recruitment, but to religious communities, to every partner we could find. We had to make the case to the whole world that creating opportunities for women and girls advances security and prosperity for everyone. So we relied on the empirical research that shows that when women participate in the economy, everyone benefits. When women participate in peacemaking and peacekeeping, we are all safer and more secure. And when women participate in the politics of their nations, they can make a difference. But as strong a case as we've made, too many otherwise thoughtful people continue to see the fortunes of women and girls as somehow separate 
from society at large. They nod, they smile, and then they relegate these issues once again to the sidelines. I have seen it over and over again. I have been kidded about it, I have been ribbed, I have been challenged in boardrooms and official offices across the world. But fighting to give women and girls a fighting chance isn't a nice thing to do. It isn't some luxury that we get to when we have time on our hands to spend doing that. This is a core imperative for every human being and every society. If we do not continue <laughs> the campaign for women's rights and opportunities, the world we want to live in, the country that we all love and cherish will not be what it should be. It is no coincidence that so many of the countries that threaten regional and global peace are the very places where women are deprived of dignity and opportunity. Think of the young women from northern Mali to Afghanistan whose schools have been destroyed or the girls across Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia who have been condemned to child marriage, or the refugees of the conflicts from Eastern Congo to Syria who endure rape and deprivation as weapons of war. It is no coincidence that so many of the countries where the rule of law and democracy are struggling to take root are the same places where women and girls cannot participate as full and equal citizens. Like in Egypt, where women stood on the front lines of the revolution but are now being denied their seats at the table and face a rising tide of sexual violence. It is no coincidence that so many of the countries making the leap from poverty to prosperity are places now grappling with how to empower women. I think it is one of the unanswered questions of the rest of this century as to whether countries like China and India can sustain their growth and emerge as true global economic powers. Much of that depends on what happens with women and girls. Now, None of these are coincidences, but instead they demonstrate, and your presence here today confirms, that we are meeting at a remarkable moment of confluence. Because in countries and communities across the globe where for generations violence against women has gone unchecked, opportunity and dignity virtually unknown, there is a powerful new current of grassroots activism stirring, galvanized by events too outrageous to ignore and enabled by new technologies that give women and girls voices like never before. That's why we need to seize this moment but we need to be thoughtful and smart and savvy about what this moment really offers to us. Now, many of us have been working, advocating, and fighting for women and girls for more decades than we care to remember. And I think we can be and should be proud of what we've achieved. Conferences like this have been a part of that progress. But let's recognize much of our advocacy is still rooted in a 20th century top-down frame. The world is changing beneath our feet and it is past time to embrace a 21st century approach to advancing the rights and opportunities of women and girls at home and across the globe.
Think about it. You know technology, from satellite television to cell phones, from Twitter to Tumblr, is helping to bring abuses out of the shadows and into the center of global consciousness. Think of the woman in that blue bra, beaten in Tahrir Square. Think of that six-year-old girl in Afghanistan about to be sold into marriage to settle a family debt. Just as importantly, technological changes are helping inspire, organize, and empower grassroots activists. I have seen this, and that is where progress is coming from and where our support is needed. We have a tremendous stake in the outcome of these efforts. Today, more than ever, we see clearly that the fate of women and girls far from here is tied up with the greatest security and economic challenges of our time. Consider Pakistan, a proud country with a rich history that recently marked a milestone in its democratic development when a civilian government completed its first full term for the very first time. And it is no secret that Pakistan is plagued by many ills, violent extremism, sectarian conflict, poverty, energy shortages, corruption, weak democratic institutions. It is a combustible mix, and more than 30,000 Pakistanis have been killed by terrorists in the last decade. The repression of women in Pakistan exacerbates all of these problems. More than five million children do not attend school and two-thirds of them are girls. The Taliban insurgency has made the situation even worse. As Malala has said and reminded us, we live in the 21st century. How can we be deprived from education? She went on to say, I have the right to play. I have the right to sing. I have the right to talk. I have the right to go to market. I have the right to speak up. How many of us here today would have that kind of courage? The Taliban recognized this young girl, 14 at the time, as a serious threat. And you know what? They were right. She was a threat. <laughs> Extremism thrives amid ignorance and anger, intimidation and cowardice. As Malala said, if this new generation is not given pens, they will be given guns. But the Taliban miscalculated. They thought if they silenced her, and thank God they didn't, that not only she but her cause would die. But instead, they inspired millions of Pakistanis to finally say, enough is enough. You heard it directly from those two brave young Pakistani women yesterday, and they are not alone. People marched in the streets, they signed petitions demanding that every Pakistani child, boy and girl alike, have the opportunity to attend school, and that in itself was a rebuke to extremists and their ideology. I am well aware that improving life for Pakistanis women is not a panacea, but it is impossible to imagine making real progress on that country's other problems, especially violent extremism without tapping the talents and addressing the needs of Pakistan's women, including reducing corruption, ending the culture of impunity, expanding access to education, to credit, to all the tools that give a woman or a man the chance to make the most of their own life and dreams. None of this will be easy in Pakistan or anywhere else, but the grassroots response to Malala's shooting gives us hope for the future. Again and again, we've seen women drive peace and progress, 
In Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant women like Inez McCormick came together to demand an end to the troubles and helped usher in the Good Friday Accords. In Liberia, women marched and protested until the country's warlords agreed to end their civil war. They prayed the devil back to hell, and they twice elected Ellen Johnson Sirleaf as the first woman president in Africa. An organization called Sisters Against Violent Extremism now connects women in more than a dozen countries who have risked their lives to tell the terrorists they are not welcome in their communities. So the next time you hear someone say, the fate of women and girls is not a core national security issue, it's not one of those hard issues that really smart people deal with, <laughs> remind them, the extremists understand the stakes of this struggle. They know that when women are liberated, so are entire societies. We must understand this too, and not only understand it, but act on it. And the struggles do not end. <laughs> struggles do not end when countries attempt the transition to democracy. We've seen that very clearly the last few years. Many millions, including many of us, were inspired and encouraged by the way women and men worked together during the, during the revolutions in places like Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. But we know that all over the world, when the dust settles, too often women's gains are lost to better organized, more powerful forces of repression. We see women still marginalized and shut out of decision making. We see women activists being targeted by organized campaigns of violence and intimidation. But still, so many brave activists, women and men alike, continue to advocate for equality and dignity for all Egyptians, Tunisians, and Libyans. They know the only way to realize the promise of the Arab Spring is with and through the full participation of half the population. Now, what is true in politics is also true in economics. In the years ahead, a number of rapidly developing nations are poised to reshape the global economy, lift millions out of poverty and into the middle class. This will be good for them, it will be good for us, it will create vast new markets and trading partners. But no country can achieve its full economic potential when women are left out or left behind. A fact underscored day after day and most recently to me, so tragically in India, concerning the young 23-year-old woman brutally beaten and raped on a Delhi bus last December. She was from a poor farming family, but like so many women and men, she wanted to climb that economic ladder. She had aspirations for her life. She studied all day to become a physical therapist. Then she went to work at a call center in the evening. She slept two, three hours a night. President Mukherjee of India described her as a symbol of all that new India strives to be. But if her life embodied the aspirations of a rising nation, her death, her murder, pointed to the many challenges still holding it back. The culture of rape is tied up with a broader set of problems, official corruption, illiteracy, inadequate education, laws, traditions, customs, culture that prevent women from being seen as equal human beings. And in addition, in many places, India and China being the leaders, a skewed gender balance with many more men than women, which contributes to human trafficking, child marriage, and other abuses that dehumanize women and corrode society. 
So millions of Indians took to the streets. In 2011, they protested corruption. In 2012, after the Delhi gang rape, the two causes merged. Demands for stronger measures against rape were joined by calls for better policing and more responsive governance for an India that could protect all of its citizens and deliver the opportunities they deserve. Some have called that the Indian Spring. Because as the protesters understood, India will rise or fall with its women. It's had a tradition of strong women leaders, but those women leaders like women leaders around the world who become presidents or prime ministers or foreign ministers or heads of corporations cannot be seen as tokens that give everybody else in society the chance to say, we've taken care of our women. So any country that wants to rise economically and improve productivity needs to open the doors. Latin America and the Caribbean have steadily increased women's participation in the labor market since the 1990s. They now account for more than half the workers. And the World Bank estimates that extreme poverty in the region has decreased by 30% as a result. Here in the United States, American women went from holding 30% of all jobs 40 years ago to nearly 48% today. And the productivity gains attributable to this increase account for more than $3.5 trillion in GDP growth over those four decades. Similarly, fast-growing Asian economies could boost their per capita incomes by as much as 14% by 2020 if they brought more women into the workforce. Laws and traditions that hold back women hold back entire societies. Creating more opportunities for women and girls will grow economies and spread prosperity. When I first began talking about this using great data from the World Bank and private sector analyses, there were doubters. They couldn't quite put the pieces together. But that debate is over. Opening the doors to one's economy, for women will make a difference. And I want to conclude with the unfinished business we face here at home. The challenges and opportunities I've outlined today are not just for people of the developing world. America must face them too if we want to continue leading the world. Traveling the globe over the last four years reaffirmed and deepened my pride in our country and the ideals we represent. But it also challenged me to think about who we are and the values we are supposed to be living here at home in order to represent abroad. After all, our global leadership for peace and prosperity, for freedom and equality is not a birthright. It must be earned by every generation. And yes, we now have American women at the high levels of business, academia, government, you name it. But as we have seen in recent months, we're still asking age-old questions about how to make women's way in male-dominated fields, how to balance the demands of work and family. The Economist magazine recently published what it called a glass ceiling index, ranking countries based on factors like opportunities for women in the workplace and equal pay. The United States was not even in the top 10. Worse, recent studies have found that on average, women live shorter lives in America than in any other major industrialized country. Think about that for a minute. We are the richest, most powerful country in the world, yet many American women today are living shorter lives than their mothers, especially those with the least education. That is a historic reversal that rivals the decline in life expectancy for Russian men after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Now, there's no single explanation for why this is happening, 
Prescription drug overdoses have spiked. Obesity, smoking, lack of health insurance, intractable poverty. But the fact is that for too many American women, opportunity and the dream of upward mobility, the American dream, remains elusive. That's just not the way it's supposed to be. I think of the extraordinary sacrifices my mother made to survive her own difficult childhood, to give me not only life, but opportunity along with love and inspiration. And I'm very proud of my own daughter, and I look at all these young women that I am privileged to work with or know through Chelsea, and it's hard to imagine turning the clock back on them. But in places throughout America, large and small, the clock is turning back. So we have work to do. Renewing America's vitality at home, strengthening our leadership abroad will take the energy and talents of all our people, women and men alike. Because if America is going to lead, we need to learn from the women of the world who have blazed new paths and develop new solutions on everything from economic development to education to environmental protection. If America is going to lead, we need to catch up with so much of the rest of the world and finally ratify the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women. If America is going to lead, we need to stand by the women of Afghanistan after our combat troops come home. We need to speak up for all the women working to realize the promise of the Arab Spring. We need to do more to save the lives of the hundreds of thousands of mothers who die every year doing, during childbirth from preventable causes and so much more. But that's not all. Because if America is going to lead the way we expect ourselves to lead, we need to empower women here at home to participate fully in our economy and our society. We need to make equal pay a reality. We need to extend family and medical leave benefits to more workers and make them paid. We need to encourage more women and girls to pursue careers in math and science. We need to invest in our people so they can live up to their own God-given potential. That is how America will lead in the world. So let's learn from the wisdom of Every mother and father who teaches their daughters there is no limit on how big she can dream and how much she can achieve. This truly is the unfinished business of the 21st century, and it is the work we are called to do. I look forward to being your partner in all the days and years ahead. Let's keep fighting for opportunity and dignity. Let's keep fighting for freedom and equality. Let's keep fighting for full participation. And let's keep telling the world over and over again that yes, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights once and for all. Thank you all so much.